Good afternoon, <laughs> and welcome to the penultimate Armenian Studies program lecture for this year, at least. Um, I would like to invite you back to on December 18th, Wednesday, 4 o'clock, the same room. We will have uh, Pedros Dermatosian, um, who's an assistant professor of history at Nebraska-Lincoln, who will be speaking about between religious and secular, the impact of the 1908 revolution. But to, today, I'm very honored um, to have Nazan Maksudian here amongst us, who's going to give a lecture. She has been kind enough to bring from Istanbul wonderful lokum. So please help yourself and sweeten your mouth uh, before she gives us her lecture. Um, Professor Maksudian is here from uh, Kemer uh, Burgaz University in Istanbul. Um, she's been teaching since. Uh, one year, year yeah. one year, and before that, she's received two postdocs from Germany, and my German is non-existent. So, from the Wissenschaft Kollege, uh, as well as the Humboldt postdoc in Berlin for the last two years. Now, Zan Maksudian's work on late Ottoman and early Republican Turkish history draws on a historiographical approach that questions the grand narratives by exploring history from below, bringing into view women, orphans, and ethnic minorities as she takes them from the margins of political, institutional, and military histories into the center of social and cultural history. Uh, Nazan Maksudian first turned to orphans and the institution of orphanages to study the late Ottoman Empire and its disciplinary projects. She focused on Ottoman vocational orphanages Islahanes, to think about the imperial order of things, from security to hygiene in urban spaces. This research was part of her PhD dissertation, which she received from Sabanji University in 2008, and is now forthcoming as the title, Listening in the Quiet, Noticing the Obscure, Orphans and Destitute Children in Late Ottoman History, from Syracuse University Press. Her edited volume, Women and the City, Women in the City, a gendered perspective from Ottoman urban history, is also under review. And uh, this allows uh, Professor Maksudian to turn her focus really directly onto women in urban spaces at a moment in time when they enter into the street and vie for access in, in a space previously dominated by men. Yesterday, she presented a fascinating article, also in progress, dealing with the rise of suicide rates among mus mostly Muslim women in Istanbul, right after the armistice in the 1920s. Through a discursive study of newspapers, police records, novels, and academic essays that turned these suicides into an epidemic, signs of women's weaknesses and hysteria, say for one academic, Max, a French academic, Mac, Max Bonafou, um, his name uh, is uh, very telling as far as his uh, desire not to make it into um, a issue of insanity, who researched and was teaching actually in Istanbul, uh, and he sees it more as a sign of social malaise. Maksudian prefers to read these suicides not as victims, but as agents engaging in willful acts. Her work has also taken on a visual turn. Um, she is part of a very interesting project in New York called Blind Dates Project. Um, it's a project that looks at new encounters from the edges of the former empire, around 13 collaborative uh, artistic projects um, at the Pratt Manhattan Gallery that began in 2010. The exhibition provides a rare platform for both artists and non-artists who were curatorially matched together to mingle and to talk about this remains of the legacy and the ruptures of the Ottoman Empire. Together with Jean-Marie Kasparian, who represented a group of black and white photographs from the much comprised Near East Foundation archives to highlight the ambiguous relationship between the rescued and the rescuer, Nazan Maksudian accompanied her work with an essay about her grandmother that transformed the fragility of the glass panels um, 
carrying it into a testimony of the death of the witness itself. Today, she will be speaking to us about visual representations of missionaries of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions and their evangelizing missions among Armenians in Anatolia. Please join me in welcoming Nazan Maksudyan. Thank you, Katrin, and thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this incredible uh, series. I'm really honored to be a part of it, and thank you for all coming. So I will start immediately. Um, the paper is called, as you see, Physical Expressions of Winning Hearts and Minds, Body Politics of the American Missionaries and Armenians of Turkey. The paper focuses on the use of visual representations and photographic descriptions by the missionaries of the American board, the ABCFM, as proofs of their proselytizing efforts. More specifically, the research is limited to the missionaries of the Asiatic Turkey Mission, namely Western Turkey Mission, Central Turkey Mission, and Eastern Turkey Mission, whose efforts centralize its, its work on Armenians, and um, in the in the East. the main argument is that the bodily conditions is it going okay the main argument is that bodily conditions of targeted constituencies and their physical surroundings houses villages were reconceived and reconceptualized by the missionaries as material representations and mirrors of religious and moral progress this was usually done in the genre of before and after photographs, one criticizing or pitying the former wretchedness of the people, and the other appraising how they grew finer. Assuming that sincere belief, or for that matter, conversion, is a delicate matter to present evidence for, these visual representations or descriptions were useful tools to convince the world of believers and contributors that these people were genuinely civilized into good Christians and were leading a Christian life. There were several missionary groups in the Ottoman Empire, but my paper focuses on the ABCFM, which was founded in 1810 and established its first missions in the empire in 1819. Continuously growing and expanding its field of activities, the ABCFM quickly became influential in most of the Anatolian provinces of the empire, especially in so uh, sociocultural fields of relief, education, and health. But, as El Shakri argued, that even though missionaries failed in their mission to save souls, since their success in terms of numbers of actual converts to the Protestant church was never very impressive, they were nevertheless said to have helped to win the battle for the conversion to modernities in the Middle East. There were significant changes in the American missionary strategies during the second half of the 19th century. Successive failure among the Muslims and the Jews, and later never-ending controversies with the Eastern churches, made them alter their approach to a great extent. As Margarian argues, the mission was transformed in, from a narrow effort to save souls into a broader program of cultivating minds. Still, Protestantism as represented by the ABCFM could become a main ideological enemy in the eyes of the Sultan, since it was considered as one of the major factors in the renaissance of Bulgarian, Armenian, and Syriac self-consciousness, especially because of their emphasis on the use of vernacular languages. So the main source of this research comes from an interesting section of the Missionary Herald, which was the most circulating board publication. The section was called For Young People. Starting from 1879, each monthly issue included a brief illustrated article designed for young people. In a short while, it was concluded that young people de department met a real want and that these articles were widely read. Many of them were copied into magazines and religious papers in the United States and in Great Britain. 
Moreover, they were compiled into two books, one in 1885 and the other in 1897, as a collection under the name of Mission Stories in Many Lands, a book for young people. So, and these books were purchased for Sunday school libraries and also used by mission circles and young people's societies. With their illustrations and touching stories, they became one of the board's uh, main conversion advertisement outlets. So many of these stories in this section focused on the misery of people and life in general in the Orient. The first group of articles told stories of those in real destitution, such as the sick, lepers, starved, orphaned, and those were genuinely physically deprived. <coughs> But more important for this paper, missionaries interpreted the bodies and dwellings of healthy people within a general picture of misery. People's bodies, so people's bodies with uh, special references to cleanliness, grooming, and dress were repeatedly problematized. Moreover, their villages, dwellings, and even interpersonal relations were under scrutiny. All these were presented as deformed or undeveloped in the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> Protestant missionary indoctrination through sermons, everyday interactions, school education, and medical care would fix these and would reform people and places into, quote, good-looking Christian entities. Human bodies and living environments were treated as representations of internalization of Christian teachings. So these were done in the sense of uh, before and after photographs. These two were actually from one article, before and after photographs. But a little uh, parenthesis about photography. So photography came to the Ottoman Empire immediately after its invention in 1839. The first known photograph is from Alexandria, Prasit Din Palace. It's, it was taken on 7 November 1839. A few days earlier, there was a news item in the official gazette on its invention. Photographers and visitors first focused on Egypt, Palestine, and then on Syria, Lebanon, and Anato Anatolia, paying much less attention to the Balkans. Photography came to Istanbul around 1850s. And at first, of course, mostly the temples and houses of prayers, inscriptions, archaeological remains were photographed. And less accessible places were less documented, and large areas in Anatolia and Arabian Peninsula were photographed only after World War II. By the mid-19th century, missionaries started to use photography as a way to authenticate their experiences in distant parts of the world and to establish a visual impression of heathenism more dramatic than could be achieved with the written word. Next to tourists, painters, artists, journalists, missionaries were the third largest group of photographers in the empire. They found it, <coughs> not here, yeah, they found it useful to illustrate their tracks with photographs, and from early on, the mission stations tried to acquire the necessary equipment and the know-how to take and print photographs. The discourse of before and after, as I said, was always present in missionary literature. It conveyed an image of accomplishment on the part of the missionaries and a promise of remarkable alteration on the part of the target. And the relationship between conversion and visual representation was a strong one in which photographs operated as a complex discursive object of power and culture. As eyewitness evidence of Ottoman reality, photographs played a significant part in reproducing the stereotype that Ottomans were degenerates in need of guidance from Protestants. The most different, interesting cases were presented to the readers, and the pictures of those whose physical features in terms of dress, cleanliness, or posture were dramatically inferior, hostile, or disruptive were used 
in the before narrative in order to justify the value of Protestant missions. On the one hand, the missionaries use this as part of their advertisement strategy. As determined apostles of their missionary societies back home, they must put forward proofs of reclamation of freedom for the long enslaved Eastern churches and proofs of spiritual conquest of the people. So basically proofs of evangelization. Since the American missionaries in the Ottoman Empire were never really successful in converting people, their narratives lacked quantitative proof and heroic conversion stories. Thus, they relied on showing how despicable pre-missionary life was and how it wonderfully improved with the intervention of Protestants. So this is, I mean, the quality is not so good, unfortunately, and since it's big, it's also a problem. But this is an ex I mean, this is a Protestant family from Syria, and it's the it's shown as an achievement. So formulaic conversion anecdotes published alongside a pair of photographs, often one taken before and other after supposed conversion within the reports and articles appeared in the Missionary Herald, and these served as proofs of achievement in the field, which was necessary to have continued flow of funds. And these representations reinforce the difference of the other, and therefore the need for missions as assimilating forces. In that sense, the missionaries depended on the ability of the photographs to convey a sense of mission to the weaver who responded with increased uh, funding. When there was, this is also interesting, when there was no visual to display certain people and places, uh, the missionaries relied on their literary skills and provided what I call photographic descriptions which touched upon every single feature and created an almost complete picture in the minds of the readers. So the propagandistic power of the photographs, these were used to tangibly confirm that evangelical activity had yielded widespread cultural and spiritual transformation. It was giving visibility to true Christianity and these were concrete proofs of inner belief that one can see, smell, and touch. So therefore, ironically, true faith, which the Protestants praised without concession, was actually reduced to a set of material, observable traits. What missionaries propagated relied on the bodies and physical surroundings of the people, and substantial changes in the cleanliness, dress, living conditions and customs of people, social progress, as it was called, became a main indicator of conversion. <clears throat> so to put it more sharply, although social change was presented as the spillover effect of proselytizing, in fact, it was the essence of conversion itself. People were, in fact, converted into a certain definition of civilization with its tangible definitions of cleanliness, neatness, nutrition, hygiene, home, domesticity, family life, child rearing, and so on, rather than into an abstract set of rules, namely religion. So first of all, missionary aspirations and the discourse of civility. Of course, this is an example from another context, but uh, it is the same kind of discourse. So missionary movement together with uh, missionary, I mean, certain histories of the missionary movement have been far particularly vulnerable to the accusation of cultural imperialism. As Makdisi underlined, the remarkable similarity of writing on the heathen and their routine denigration of foreign culture and de their determination to restructure, restructure them have made them an obvious target. It's apparent that American board adopted a resolute Puritan equation of its particular Christianity with civilization 
and paved the way for the reproduction of the discourse of the stagnant East with its ignorant, unenlightened, non-white peoples. Photography played a crucial role in the classification, conceptualization, and visualization of other peoples. Even as late as the turn of the century, photographs were still imbued with the unencumbered spirit of the Enlightenment idea of the noble savage. Therefore, the discourse of educating and reforming the heathens by the messengers of civilization and Christianity was very strong. Although there were some infrequent tones of curiosity for indigenous forms of life, the missionaries were often judgmental in their evaluation of the peoples of the East. Most local customs and traditions were interpreted as evil, degenerate forms of religiosity, and the cure was to introduce them to true Christianity. Photographs usually preferred to exhibit different communal groups and tribes, costumes, traits, staged with primitivizing proofs as ideas of clearly visible superiority developed by racist aspects of 19th century evolutionary thinking. In this respect, missionaries' life line of thinking was shaped with a progressivist tendency that societies and peoples would eventually progress from a backward state of existence to modernity, so from barbarism to civility. Thus, different religious and linguistic communities in Anatolia were assumed to be at an earlier stage of their march towards civilization. From within this ideological framework, the function and value of photographs of Christian converts was primarily attached to their meaning as documents of progress as a historical process. Therefore, photography, within the context of cultural criticism and even contempt for the other, was also instrumentalized for disciplinary purposes. It was a record of the converted subjects. So the images and imagery produced a dynamic rhetoric of cultural and ethnographic difference between evangelical Protestants and non-Christian peoples and places. The logic behind the use of material was without doubt to il illustrate how miracles happened with religion. Western styles of dress, hairdressing, postures, and looks, physical hygiene, were all treated as signifiers of Protestant faith, piety, and virtue that native peoples come to embrace. So through conversion, nominal or professing Christians, as they call the Armenians, found not only religious guidance, but also moved forward along the evolutionary path to civility. So their discourse had a number of uh, different um, roots. One was about the domesticity, the discourse of domesticity. Uh, Barbara Reeves Ellington discussed this in terms of the missions in Bulgaria. So in this section, I will discuss how a good wife, a good family, and a Christian home is discussed by the missionaries. So the changing status of the groups undergoing conversion to Christianity was frequently understood and expressed in terms of how women were treated and conducted themselves. In other words, it was assumed that the condition of women in a country was the measure of civilization. Women's behavior and appearance therefore received significant attention and became widely re recognized index of the general transformation inner and outer, spiritual and social, that society at large experienced. As Reeves argued, the Victorian discourse of domesticity and the place of women in the social order influenced the strategies of the American missionaries. Women were responsible for the management of the household, welfare of the family, and shaping the character of their children they would exert a profounding civilizing influence on their children, so the future generations, husbands, and society. So they were the custodians of the home 
and their moral superiority and generic spirituality qualified them as social and religious reformers. The missionaries promoted, therefore, that non-Christian religions led to the degradation of women, while Christianity provided not only salvation, but also civilization. So this Orientalist discourse about the sorrowful status of women played a key role in mobilizing women in the West to support missionary work. Thus, the, the association of educated womanhood with Christianity and national progress was predicated upon despised images of non-Christian and also nominally Christian women. Among them, of course, inevitably Muslim women uh, were the most used trope. So stereotypical images of degraded Muslim women, as they frequently appeared in the Missionary Herald, served as advertisement for the work of American missionaries and as fundraising tools. So very frequently, the American missionaries in Anatolia repeated their criticisms towards codes of behavior between men and women and respect within the family. And according to their interpretation, women were considered second class in the Orient. The value of daughters was always lower than that of the sons. And women were not considered equals of men. And there was no exchange of words between husband and wife in public spaces. Though these criticisms, criticisms mostly targeted the Muslims, the after picture uh, was the same for the Christian as well. So this is an example of the before uh, description. So the mother of the household stands meekly by, her mouth and nose should be covered, she may not sit in the presence of her Lord, etc. We don't need to read everything. But then this is an Armenian family, and I quote, the picture on the next page shows a typical Armenian family the old patriarch is seen in the center, leaning on his staff. His four sons are seated on either side, the eldest on his right, while the women and the children of the household are grouped about them. They all live in one house, eat at one table. As the old father is too feeble to manage their business, the oldest son is now head of the family, all the others being subject to him. This, this is the interesting part. One of the boys is a graduate of the Bardizak High School. You will have no difficulty in picking him up. So th I mean, I just wanted to help you a little bit. <coughs> so the addi in addition to emphasis on domestic virtues, Christian missionaries also promoted a specific discourse of respectability which necessitated a radical transformation of the style of femininity to which convert women were expected to conform. Therefore, I quote, sleeping with daytime clothes, not making any toilet in the morning, or not paying attention to their own or their children's dressing or hair, end of quote, were serious ills besetting to native women and thus should be cured. In fact, conversion required the redressing of women and the introduction of Christianity into communities could be detected in the Western style clothing and hairstyle that women adopted. As part and parcel of their efforts to push women to adopt their style of fashion, in some cases, women's authentic dresses and hairstyles became topics of insult and humiliation. For instance, a certain form of headdress common among the Greeks of the Black Sea area was ridiculed because of its re resemblance to a toothache covering. I quote, you notice the headdress peculiar to the Greek women of that region, the arrangement of which impresses you constantly with the fear that they are suffering from chronic neuralgia or toothache. So family, in terms of family, the missionaries attempted with patient preparation and infinite effort, quote, to reconstruct the family as an institution. 
since it was, again, quote, a thoroughly disorganized institution, in most instances, a pulverized moral ruin. What existed before the advent of missionary in the empire was the absolute and irresponsible sovereignty of the husband, which meant unreasonable caprice and self-assertion. Especially due to very low marriage age, the couples were usually not mature enough to build healthy relationships. So that artificial standards of family intercourse made life at home unbearable to witness for the missionaries due to its, quote, stupidity and unnaturalness. And the ABCFM missionary narrative underlined that in Protestant homes, so in the after picture, it was now possible to see the mother and daughters eating at the same table with their fathers and sons, quote, a thing unheard of in the good old days before Protestant innovations. Moreover, when families went out on the weekends for recreation, it was now possible to see women chatting with their husbands as much as they wished. Thanks to the gospel, not only were relations and companionships between husband and wife improved, but also a form of emancipation for women regarding speech, clothing, thinking and decision making was realized. As visual testimony of the success of the American missionaries of Eastern Turkey mission, so to give a correct idea of families as they argued, the villagers from one region were photographed before and after their adherence to the faith. The first picture, I quote, depicted the coarse, scanty clothing, the stolid faces, the use of the ox as a beast of burden, a few copper and earthen vessels in which to cook and eat their food, and some coarse carpets under which they might sleep at night on the ground, forming the sum of their household utensils. The pictures which were to promote the transforming gospel influences on family life after 12 years of missionary work were also exhibited in order, quote, to bear witness to missionary achievement. So as the last chain of the discourse of domesticity, um, the missionaries were trying to baptize villages and homes of their targeted populations in Anatolia. Pre-modern, pre-industrial patterns of livelihood in multiple realms of production, consumption, nutrition, and dwellings were interesting for missionaries. Yet, they were also demonized as indicators of ignorance and false belief. Photographic explorations of economic underdevelopment and lower standards of living were sometimes associated with communal or religious authority. Moreover, photographic representations had a tendency to couple economic, cultural, and moral identity of Ottoman people with stereotypes of disarray, dirtiness, poverty, idleness, and irrationality. So the ABCFM missionaries of Turkey mission were extremely critical of at least two aspects of local domestic life. One was sleeping and living in the same room, and two was eating from a common pot. They even claimed that Neither in the Turkish or Armenian language is there any word for home. And all that there is is a house or dwelling place, which is misinformation. Thus houses and physical surroundings were targets of conversion. And this meant teaching and imposing their own standards of home on the natives. Based on their physical and material expectation of a home, the missionaries worked for the inculcation of a new sense and concept of home, together with new home ethics and home economics. The missionaries described that the social life of the Ottomans as one of great degradation. Since people's dwellings usually consisted of just one room, the Americans argued that they were living and eating and sleeping like domesticated animals 
In fact, in a consistent and repeated manner, the houses were compared to stables and people to animals. It was argued, I quote, that the whole family herded in an often filthy and unwholesome room. In a similar way, it was claimed that many families were content to occupy the same winter quarters as their cattle in dark, unventilated stables. Therefore, the before photograph, which was both usually and verbally presented, was something like the following. So it's the same photograph that I show, and now you have it before and after version. So formerly these homes, writes the gates of Harput, were of a very low type. In the village of Midyat, I mean, this is not Midyat, but it's a similar description. In the village of Midyat 15 years ago, there was scarcely a house of more than one story, and they were all without windows and chimneys. The hole in the roof by which the smoke was supposed to find exit was never directly over the fire, lest some enemy should come upon the roof and throw down gunpowder. <clears throat> the door never opened directly into the room in which the family lived, but was guarded by grain bins and the like, lest some foe should shoot them before their own fire. So it was declared with pride that with the establishment of the mission stations, the living conditions of the locals were dramatically transformed and uplifted from that of the beast to that of man. So, from that of the barbarity to the level of civility, new minds aroused by the gospel were not simply building additional rooms to their houses, but they were in fact starting to appreciate the fact, I quote, that man is higher than the animal and so worthy of a better place in which to live. As apparent from the language used regarding gender relations, the missionaries were convinced that convinced that the realization of all their aims, namely reforming the family life, the emergence of a true Christian home, and the emergence of better physical surroundings was absolutely dependent on the missionary influences over women either in form of educating, civilizing, or converting. So <clears throat> here is, again, after photograph. This is from uh, Erzurum. As you can see, you have two-story buildings now. So projecting the language and jargon of conversion into physical surroundings and places, the missionary reports underline that in quote, great and blessed changes were apparent in thousands of homes thanks to the direct influence of the missionary work. It was underlined that the appearance of many villages was transformed with the construction of completely new types of houses. These were houses made of stone, two or three stories high, furnished with stoves, chairs, cloaks, other furniture, had windows of glass, so merely material changes in dwelling conditions were dubbed blessed since family life has been elevated for them. Moreover, the entrance of the gospel into a place was visible at the very first sight. So villages and houses were converted and baptized along with people. So it's, they argue that when gospel has gained an entrance into a house or village, home means much more than it did. There is more intelligent outlook upon the world at large. The whole appearance of the house and family shows more cleanliness and neatness. And they have an example. So look at the contrast between his native village hut, the animals sharing the same apartments with the family, and the comfortable home he now occupies. So as the, almost the last part of my talk, I will talk a little bit about the body politics. As I have underlined, the missionaries assume that inner religious belief were perceptible through material state of bodies. So styles of dress, manners, physical decorum, and cleanliness were taken to be the outward signs of piety and virtue. 
Therefore, embracing Western-style clothing and hairdressing, postures, and rules of hygiene were coupled with conversion to Protestant faith. Therefore, metamorphosis from false to true Christianity required a process of bodily refashioning imposed by missionaries' own standards of clothing, appearance, sanitation, and hygiene. In their efforts to tame and correct bodies, the missionaries first of all underlined the importance of cleanliness and personal hygiene and worked hard to foster cleanliness as a social virtue in many places. Shin Kim calls this form of Christianity as an antiseptic religion. By the intermingling of Christianity and the concept of hygiene, there occurred a discourse of medicalized religion. Most of the physicians within the American Missionary Corps were influenced by the germ theory of illness and considered Western medicine as an efficient tool to evangelize the country. From the hygiene side of the picture, washing away sins from the soul became analogous to washing away germs from the body. So the missionaries frequently argued that dirt is domesticated in the homes of the people and this, quote, disgusting slovenliness, in many instances intolerable filth, is more or less characteristic of the individual. Therefore, the most compelling duty of the Christian missions was to teach basics of sanitation and cleanliness. So it was underlined that converts in all mission fields were without exception becoming more prepossessing and more tidy in person and environment. To such an extent that they claimed converts were visibly recognizable by their state of hygiene. Nively converted people and communities, quote, immediately evinced a desire to change the sanitary conditions of their homes as well as their bodies. It was repeatedly reported that much greater regard to the laws of health in the arrangement of homes and in attention to cleanliness of the person was apparent. In fact, these changes were largely brought about by the instruction of the missionaries in their work fields. Those who were educated in American schools and colleges were following new rules that they had been taught, and thus they were important transmitters of this knowledge and as pioneers and models for their communities. For instance, this Next to this picture, there is this code. So the picture above gives a good idea of the kind of boys who are being educated. That's the last part is more interesting. If you could only see the boys as they were when they first come to us, you would understand at once what a wonderful change Christian education brings not only in thought and feeling, but in personal appearance as well. This other picture from a kindergarten at Eintop, this is also an interesting quote. The bright, eager faces looking out upon us from the picture on the next page are those of the teachers and scholars of the kindergarten at Eintop, Turkey. They are all but one Armenians. And when you remember that Armenians almost always have very black hair and eyes, you will easily pick out the single American girl. I think that's it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, the impact of missionary education was so much praised that it was thought that one could easily tell those who were in some contact with the Protestants since the word of the gospel was not only changing their inner beliefs, but was also apparently projected into their looks. So this is from another kindergarten in Smyrna. And the quote says, I dare say you will think at once as you look at this beautiful group that these do not look like children needing to have missionaries sent to them. And so they are not. In fact, they are themselves preparing to be missionaries to the people of Turkey who have not yet received the gospel. So these are kindergarten students, but the missionaries are sure that they're preparing to be missionaries. 
The second trope under the rubric of body politics was knitted around the issues of health and disease. In the second half of the 19th century, the rapprochement of spiritual conversion to bodily improvement found expression in the promotion of natural science. Missionaries regarded the natural sciences, especially medicine, as part of their broader spiritual commitments. Although early medical activity by missionaries was usually short-term humanitarian response, medical activity soon encompassed a long-term strategy prompted by the progress of conversion. Medical work by missionary physicians was generally associated with the dissemination of belief and the message of conversion. So it was not only bodies that receive attention in these hospitals and clinics, but souls as well, they argued. So in that respect, the cure of the souls went hand in hand with the cure of the diseases. Daniel Bliss, who had joined the Syria mission in 1855 and who served at the Syrian Protestant College uh, for 30 years argued that healing and training in the medical arts and sciences offer one way to fulfill the promise of conversion, either through assuming the role of Christ in healing the body and soul and extracting, extracting somatic and spiritual evils or by striking at degraded superstitions. Moreover, there was an appreciation of the value of medical missionaries, especially in areas where missions penetration was otherwise extremely difficult or where disease made their activity problematic. So the missionaries quickly discovered the indisputable usefulness of medical services in the breaking down opposition, dissipating prejudice, and entering into the hearts and homes of the high and the low the rich and the poor. So they frequently underlined that health-related activities received the highest official recognition in the empire and thus facilitated the working of all other branches. So <coughs> doctors were welcomed into houses, even of the state officials and state bureaucrats. So caring for the sick was a remarkable opportunity to spread the Protestant influence and penetrate into the communities. <coughs> so medical missions were founded with the explicitly stated objective of entering into the homes. And there people's bodies were utilized as gates to their beliefs and the betterment of their physical condition was interpreted as a sign of religious enlightenment. <coughs> For instance, while describing the activities of a leper asylum in Palestine, it was honestly declared that patients were treated with the quote, with the double objective of relieving their sufferings and leading them to the savior who could heal their souls. In a very telling story about a young woman with leprosy who was blinded by the disease, the discursive relation between the bodily ills and the salvation of the soul was clearly established. It was underlined that she grew in grace with the knowledge of the Bible and that she started to bear her suffering with admirable patience. So it was underlined that personal services of physicians facilitating certain sanitary measures which were neglected by the communities. So Christians, I mean Protestants, were exceptional, exceptional, had an exceptional immunity during disease uh, epidemics. Oh. Sorry. Um, so testimonies from various mission state stations pointed to this fact and were shown as material proofs of the gains of the converts. So in the quote you see, in time of cholera, it has been noticed that the evangelical communities were to a marked degree free, free from the plague. So that in the region of Kilikia, a Turkish official said, how is it? Oh, Protestants, has God spread his tent over you that you are so spared? 
and the doctor attribute this largely to the greater cleanliness and less fear of death prevailing among Christians. So as the last part, I will talk about philanthropy and orphans. So I talked about cleanliness and hygiene, health and disease. So this is just the last part before the conclusion. So the essence of their body politics was crystallized in the description and depiction of the orphans in their orphanages. In other words, those who were in a most extreme destitution before arrival and who were under absolute missionary control thereafter. The ABCFM had always embraced philanthropy as part of its missionary mandate, and specifically four departments of missionary work were emphasized. The conversion, the publication, education, and philanthropy, including free medical service, hospitals, and the like. So missionaries were organizing relief measures in cases of fires, earthquakes, famines, etc. Moreover, when they were faced with many limitations, orphans seemed to be an outstanding advantage. They were more or less free from their family ties, which normally made conversion difficult or even impossible. Still, the opening of ABCFM orphanages only started after the Armenian massacres of 1894-96, which probably orphaned around 50,000 children. Before this date, American missions only had a few uh, orphanages, but after these massacres, they opened about 80 orphanages in more than 30 districts. And the orphans in these orphanages were usually from 50 to 500. But in average, most orphanages had around 100 children. So even this was an unexpected situation for them. The missionaries in the field were content with their operations, despite many inconveniences they had to face. So in the end, they found a great opportunity to make a massive impact on the local population. So before and after narrative was especially exaggerated in missionary writings about orphans and orphanages. Long depictions of children's bodily features were provided, describing in detail how they were received in miserable conditions of dirt, sores, and vermin, and how they were tamed in the hands of the missionaries into clean, good-looking, well-behaved children. So orphan girls, they say, coming literally in drags without shoes or anything warm for winter were furnished with plain but neat cotton or woolen dresses. They were, I quote, now clean, merciful, obedient, rapidly learning both in books and in Christian life, so different from the wretched little creatures they were when they first came in. So the missionaries try to change the social behavior patterns of the orphans, especially by impl implementing Protestant work ethics. Among their main pedagogical aims were cleanliness, passion and continuity at work, teamwork and mutual responsibility. The American missionaries argued that the orphans they had sheltered, clothed, cared for and disciplined were regarded with admiration by the whole community around them as their physical conditions improved after they were institutionalized. An anecdote from Urfa <coughs> exemplifies the perception. Quote, as these boys were taking a walk on a recent day, a group of people stopped to gaze at them, and one said, does Miss Shatok pick out all the fine boys in the community for her orphanage? No, replied the another. They grow fine after she has had them a little while. So as dirty, half-starved, neglected orphans, they were other children based on otherness of need, poverty, and undesirability. The missionary relief thus made them both children and believers as a useful tool to convince the world of believers. So before and after photographs were again used uh, to exhibit the progress realized with these other children and how these orphans were transformed into good Christians. So children were not only physically cleaned and cared for, 
but they were transformed into sleek, bright, and interesting children. So that was here, yeah. So he is, this is a quote from the Mardin uh, missionary. So he says, we could wish the city claimed a photographer, as then we could enclose a couple of contested pictures of some of these wards of Christendom. I mean, you've read it already. So missionaries were so convinced of the power that photography exerted upon their supporters and contributors, Dr. Gates of Harput even wrote that if he were able to send pictures of these wretched little waves, he would not read he would not need write anything. Actually, the article contains a photo, an orphan called Aram, as he's called, taken just as he came to the orphanage at Harput. However, he says, this boy was not as destitute and wretched as many of the children when they first came. So they took a picture, but they're not happy with the misery here. So in other words, this before picture was not as heartbreaking or shocking as the missionaries wanted it to be. Just as in the case of lamenting for not finding a photographer to document the before and after conditions of children, missionaries regret regretted the fact that the photograph could not capture the extent of the misery they want to present, advertise to the world. Still, the sense of contrast was created with after pictures that would compensate for it. So, again, quote, but it does not take a great while to change their whole appearance. They are washed and clean, but coarse clothing is given to them and they are fed on simple food, which seems to them like the greatest of luxuries. The contrast between Aram and some of the other picture which follow will indicate some degree what this orphanage work has done for the children. So in this picture, boys from the orphanage at Urfa was shown at dinner time. Again, they are neatly dressed, well prepared within the dining hall with a smile in their faces. This time, missionary described both the kind of food they're about to have and religious content of their upbringing in the orphanage by referring to the blessing they prayed just before starting to eat. So with these two photographs, the reader was warned to look onto this picture and then on the other, and what changes happened by this work of orphans. And they say, it's not a medicine that we're advertising. Again, the word advertisement is very interestingly all over the place, but the medicine that we have is basically Christianity. So conclusion, the subject of my paper was the use of visual representations, particularly photography, by missionaries as evidence to be presented to their supporters of successful conversions. The research explores how the American missionaries utilize bodily and physical conditions as material representations and mirrors of the religious and moral state of people. In that sense, as tangible proofs and easily malleable targets, refashioning bodies and places were part of the missionary agenda in their general aspirations to convert. What is more, given the difficulty in providing evidence for conversion, these material and physical transformations were the only solid outcomes of their efforts and also the only advertisable results of the work. So unable to precisely measure or clearly exhibit the extent of religious reformation that conversion work had brought about, missionaries devised tangible material proofs as justifications of their achievements. So even if the Protestant missionaries were fanatically opposed to idolatry or any form of outward-centered signs of belief, their utmost praise of the external appearance of the Christians was not very different from what they accuse of nominally faithful to be doing. Thank you.